in the studio with us. I'm pleased to have back our good friend Alex Lawson, the executive director of Social Security Works, which is a nice little, uh, is that a pun or a, what's, what's the? What? A statement of uh, belief and our mission, all embodied in one. Uh, yeah, no, it's not a pun, it's a double entendre. It is. That's something that's that means what it two is. things. Yeah, double entendre. Social Security Works is the website, uh, socialsecurityworks.org. And I want to get you on, Alex. There are a lot of young people whose parents are aging into eligibility for Social Security and Medicare uh, who may be listening or watching, and their parents may be coming to them with questions, or their parents may be getting advice from people who don't necessarily have their best interests at heart. There's a whole industry out there of, you know, let me help you, give me some money and let me help you. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's also a lot of people listening and watching who themselves are baby boomers and are aging into this. And I'm one of them. Uh, Louise and I are, are, are two of them. And so I, you know, I, I, I'll start with our example and just ask your advice, which is, <laughs> it's so cool being a talk show host. I don't have to go out and pay somebody to tell me this stuff. I will, <laughs> uh, in May of next year, I will turn 65, which used to be the retirement age. I think for people my age, it's now 66. Right. But uh, in any case, next year I turn 65, Louise turns 63. I've been drawing a paycheck against my, my company, against this business for years and years. Louise has not. She's Social Security eligible right now. She's 62. Um, should she apply for Social Security? And, because, and, and then should we file separately instead of jointly on our taxes? I mean, what's, what's the situation? When, when should somebody in, in her position, because that's one of the more common ones, you know, a spouse mm -hmm. who has worked on and off. She's worked on and off throughout her life, but most of the time we consolidate her, because we've always owned our own companies, we consolidate our income so we're not double paying our uh, our uh, payroll insurance. Mm -hmm. So anyway, your thoughts. So you have been paying in. One thing just to start that I think does clarify some things is uh, you said you're turning 65. The full retirement age is 66 for uh, people your age, your right. cohort, which is, which is correct. Right. But if you want your listeners to really understand uh, how the system works, if you just change full retirement age to full benefit age, because it has nothing to do with when you retire, right? right. You can retire whenever you oh, want. I, you can. I plan to be doing this show for at least another decade. I mean, now, <laughs> I don't, I'm not retired. I'm not going. To, and that good. was my other question because I'm going to continue to have an income, and and Louise is going to continue not to. So, so the full benefit age is the age at which your full benefit that you're in you're entitled to your full benefit. Right. Um, every year that you draw before that which you can go down to 62, which would be early. Um, right. That is a 7% reduction in your benefits for per year. per year, and it's forever. Mm. So if you claim early, uh, then you have permanently reduced your benefits uh, forever by 7% each year, which right. is why, just to go policy for a second, that's why those proposals that the right always puts in they sound like it has something to do with how long you work, but they have nothing to do with that. They only have to do with the amount of benefits that you're going to get. Because uh, if they raise that full benefit age, it's a 7% cut for every year it goes up. Wow. So here is the general uh, advice that I think is important for everyone to understand. You're going to make a decision based on your situation, yours and Luis's situation, right? And you're going to know that um, your medical needs are a, a, a part of under of choosing, you know, when you are going to claim your benefits. Uh, so people's individual medical situations, uh, their health, the history in their family of longevity, the knowledge that women live longer than men. Um, things like that do, you should take those into account. Yeah, Louise's mother is in her mid-80s. Her grandmother died at 96. She's probably going to live a long, long time. And um, that's important with Social Security because, as you know, it's that you cannot outlive Social Security. Right. You can outlive your savings. You can outlive everything but Social Security. So right. for the oldest of the old, uh, which is um, more women than men because women live longer, you are looking at... Uh, relying more on social security. So she would be well advised not to start taking social security now, but to wait until she's what? 66 is the maximum benefit age. Actually. So that's the full benefit age, or the full benefit age. Yeah. And every year after that, up to the age of 70, you get a 7% increase. In so your so really the, the full retirement age now is 70. 
Uh, I think actuarially the full the full benefit age or, or retirement age is still it's 66 and it's going up to 67 for for people my age. Right. Um, but there is a uh, there is an incentive in the benefit structure. So actually, that's the those are the ben- that's the total benefit that you've earned. Right. Each year after that, you actually are getting more. Right. So it's an increase. Right. right. Um, and the reason the each year you wait, you are not getting benefits, right? Right. So you're not getting benefits between, let's say, six. So the question is, is is that 7% that you're losing exactly. uh, greater or less than the amount of money you're going to make between the time that you, re- quote, retire, start taking Social Security and the time that you die? Exactly. So that's why the taking into account medical history, uh, longevity in the family, knowing that men live, uh, uh, that women live longer than men. Didn't Social Security used to be just a flat rate? You turn sixty-five and you got a certain amount of money. No, these. Uh, or these, has it always been this way? It's always been. Uh, there's tweaks along the way, so it looks right. a little different. But generally, this is the the formula that all the it, way back to the thirties. Generally, yes. Huh, um, I have. To, I'd have to look in on. The, the spousal benefit has been made better over time mm-hmm. um, because the spousal benefit is really important um, for, and and we need to do more there, but I won't go on policy. Right. It's really important for exactly your setup, your situation, right? Because it would be very unfair uh, if, if Louise couldn't claim any social security benefits because clearly working with you, you know, that's what has allowed you to pay in for your social security. Right. And then she does have a claim on those social security benefits. Right. So the spousal benefit, the basic uh, part of that is after 10 years of marriage, um, then a right. person can claim on their spouse's um, work history. And usually, even if if, uh, if somebody has worked at periods during their life and then not, right, you still get your, your statement and it says, as long as you have enough quarters, it says, this is your work, this is your workers, right? right? And you have an amount. So we've been married 43 years. Does that mean that she can claim against my social security? That's exactly what it means, yes. And she could do that now? Does that fix my social security payments at a lower rate down the road? And and can both spouses be drawing social security? This is how ignorant I am about this stuff. And this is actually where it gets most complicated, actually. So it's not at all, I don't think okay. that you are by any means alone on this one. Yeah. Um, the best, and I, I, I'm going to answer questions, but still the best resource for this is actually ssa.gov itself. Mm. You go to social to the spousal benefit, look at it. Um, if you have your benefit statements, you can see the numbers on there. Mm-hmm. A big danger is if you turn people just out to the internet and they just Google this, you'll get pages and pages of people who want to give you advice and take uh, your money and take your money because their their advice is usually actually if you have a financial planner if somebody or your listeners have financial planners the first question you should ask them is what about my social security and if their answer is not well you can count on your social security and it's the foundation that you build uh, the rest of your retirement on you should find another financial planner. Because if they say anything like, it's not going to be there for you, so claim as early as possible, things like that, that's just them trying to scare you into putting more money with them. Right. Um, there is Right, and there's no law against that, oddly enough. Elizabeth none. Warren has been talking about that. Your financial advisors can actually lie to you. They can sell you products that make them money but cost you money right. and not disclose that to you. And in fact, that is the norm, apparently, in financial services these days, rather, at least with people who are not rich. Right. You know, you, you the financial planners who lie to rich people tend to get in trouble. Financial pl- planners who lie to middle class and working people, they make a fortune. They get bonuses. Yeah, exactly. Alex Lawson is with us from Social Security Works. We'll be taking your calls, too, if you have questions about Social Security. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And Medicare, and all that stuff that goes along with it. Alex Lawson, the website, socialsecurityworks.org, and you can tweet Alex at ALAW202. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you live from Washington, D.C. Alex Lawson, the Executive Director of Social Security Works. Socialsecurityworks.org is the website. The uh, Twitter is uh, SSWorks, at SSWorks, or at ALAW202. Alex Lawson, the Executive Director, is here with us answering your questions about Social Security, Medicare, retirement, all those kind of things. Um, You know, just uh, trying to learn this stuff, trying to figure it out. Um, Alex, just to the 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 net net bottom line on what Louise and I should do is 
and and I'm not asking for specific advice just to, uh, let's say, somebody in our situation. Uh-huh. Um, should I just like keep taking a paycheck and just keep waiting and not tap Social Security as long as possible? Is It is generally, again, generally, but is the best course of action, actually, because yeah. if you have other savings. Assuming I'm healthy. Right. Yeah. It's all about um, you. You think about, you know, how how many years are you going to be claiming Social Security? Right. Um, so if you have other assets uh, that can or, or, you know, you're still working, right. the longer you delay your Social Security benefit, the higher it is. And a 7 percent permanent increase for each year you wait past your full benefit age is is huge. Right. right. I mean, a ma- uh, inflation protected annuity and you're getting seven more percent on that. You know, especially in this weird economic situation right. uh, where we are right now, there's nothing that really beats that. Now, meanwhile, somebody said to me the other day uh, that if I didn't register for Medicare on time, that I would lose eligibility for it or I'd get penalized or something like that. I'm not sure if I want Medicare or not. I get health insurance with my job. I mean, you know, I own the company. We give full health insurance, 100% paid to all of our employees. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got that. You know, if, if I get it, everybody gets it. Uh, what's the story with Medicare? Uh, your friend was right. You have to you have to make sure that you apply uh, for your Medicare that you've paid for, um, you've paid into. You then do have to decide, okay, you don't have to take your Medicare. Right. You can keep your private health insurance. Uh, but almost across the board, especially for things that come up later in a person's life, um, the private health insurance is not going to, to actually measure up uh, to what Medicare provides really? people. Medicare is better insurance for somebody over 65 than what they would buy from a for-profit company. I mean, each it's it's specific, but I yeah. would say that Generally I'm speaking. super comfortable saying um, almost all the time now, it's what, better. Now, what about, you know, Stephen J. Hemsley, the CEO of United Healthcare, has taken over a billion dollars out of his company in compensation over the years. His predecessor, Dollar Bill McGuire, took $1.7 billion. Every penny of that was taken, you know, Profit on selling health insurance, and the, uh, apparently one of the big products that United Healthcare offers through AARP is supplemental health insurance to fill in the holes of Medicare. When did those holes appear? Uh, why are they there? Why do we have to buy supplemental insurance? Does that have you know? Does that go through the Social Security Administration? Should I be talking to United Healthcare or AARP or not? Uh, you know, what's the situation? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, it's a really, I know nothing about this. It's a really important one because actually, as I was saying, um, you know, Medicare, I'm actually thinking of the full complement, which unfortunately means including Medigap coverage, which is what you're talking about. Um, that the part that really no one can match is for unforeseen things. Um, so the hospital insurance on Medicare is unmatchable Mm. um and that is super important later uh in in later in life sure things Um, break more easily yes and let me tell you and chronic chronically (laughs) um and things that you know there's very uh, oftentimes one thing leads to another um and so there's a lot more hospitalization um and stephen helmsley did not make one billion dollars in income by providing people health care right i mean they're in the business of denying people health care right take your premiums deny you health care right um and so Oftentimes when a person is sick uh, and needs that health care most, that's when they're least likely to be able to wade through all of the paperwork, the denials. It's a routinized denial, right? I mean, they oh, I, I had United Healthcare as a health insurance company for a couple of years and every single claim, not every single, but a wild number of the claims that my doctor or our hospitals would submit, they would kick Denied. back to us. And then you've got to you've got to protest them, and and uh, that's how they make their you know. money. Well, weirdly enough, I mean, we had Blue Cross Blue Shield for a while, and we never had that problem. They just paid everything. So one thing is uh, uh, the worst part of that is yeah. that they actually the the more serious it is, right? So the more chronic or serious that right. it is, the more likely they are going to deny it uh, as long as possible right. because they're literally betting on people dying. Before, before they pay. they're able to, right. right. I mean, that's so, how cynical it is. So, oh, okay. So it's it's a pretty disgusting system with the Medigap coverage, but still, do we have to do it? Uh, it, it so 
I would say Medigap, if you can. And again, mm-hmm. you have to look at your current policy versus Medicare with Medigap. It's still going to be, and for your listeners, Medicare is going to be almost certainly the best option. Now, that I'm they two have. years older than my wife. She's on. She's covered by my health insurance policy from this company. Yes. If I go on Medicare next year when I turn 65, what happens to Louise? Uh, that's a good. That's a great point, and that would be something that you'd want to take into account um, because she's covered on your policy. Um, I. That's a good question, Tom. I don't have that specific answer, okay. um, but I think if you don't have that coverage, then she can't actually claim on that health insurance. Right. Right. So, and and there are people at Medicare and at Social Security whose job is to answer these kind of questions at the Social Security office. Yeah, okay. which is where you ssa.gov. Yep. Right. We'll be back with your questions for Alex Lawson. You're listening to the Tom Hartman program. Call 202-536-2370. We're talking with Alex Lawson, SS at SS Works if you want to tweet or at ALAW202. The website is socialsecurityworks.org. 